So we looked at how we can measure if evolution is happening. Now let's look at, well, what is a species? How do we get new species? So I want us to start by analyzing some experimental results. Here in this experiment, some fruit flies were grown together and then separated. Some were raised for multiple generations on starch. Others were raised for multiple generations on maltose. For 40 generations, these flies only ate maltose and were separated for 40 generations from the ones that only ate starch. And here's what happened in the control group. This is showing you starch populations mating together. Everybody mated with everybody. But notice what happened here. Here's female and starch and maltose, starch and maltose, and who mated with who. In the Ed Puzzle, what do you think these results suggest? Well, if you notice here, the starch males are preferring the starch females and the maltose males are preferring the maltose females. There is a little interbreeding between the two, but not much. Something has changed to where now there's a preference of who mates with who. If you remember from the Five Fingers evolution, non-random mating. If there's a mating preference, that can lead to a new species. This experiment conclusively approved in a very short amount of time, only 40 generations of flies, and they live for a very short amount of time, that a new species can develop with something as small as a preference for food. So we're going to work with the definition that a species is a population whose members can interbreed and produce viable offspring. We need to look at how and why new species reproduce. And the key to that is looking at the reproductive process itself, why some organisms reproduce together and some don't. So this is all about reproductive isolating mechanisms. Some isolating mechanisms occur before fertilization, so before sperm meets egg. We call those prezygotic barriers because it's before the zygote. And other barriers are after the zygote forms. That's where there is sperm meeting egg, but something happens that prevents it from forming into a new species. So I'm going to go through all of the examples of these. Geographic isolation, ecological, temporal, behavioral, mechanical, and comedic. These are all of our pre-zygotic barriers, or barriers that prevent reproduction before a zygote can form. First one is geographic, and this is a real example. Before the Grand Canyon formed, there was a squirrel population that lived in the same area. When that Grand Canyon appeared, of course, very, very long time, it separated the squirrel population. They were no longer able to intermingle. So now you have two populations that are each experiencing meiosis, genetic diversity, over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Now when we reintroduce them, they no longer interbreed. So because they were geographically isolated by a canyon, no longer able to reproduce, this prezygotically prevented the continuation of one species and created two. Now we have completely different species on each side of the Grand Canyon. This is slightly different than another type of isolation called ecological isolation. This is when species live in the same area, but because they live in different niches, they rarely encounter each other. For example, these two snakes. These garter snakes, one always lives in fresh water, the other lives on land. They could reproduce and make an organism, but they don't because the water one never goes on land and the land one never goes in water. They're ecologically isolated. Same thing with tigers and lions. Tigers and lions can reproduce. You can have tigons and ligers, but lions exist in the grasslands and tigers exist in the rainforest. They have completely different niches and needs for their survival, so they don't intermingle. They're ecologically isolated. There's also temporal isolation. For humans, we can reproduce year round. We're on what's called the menstrual cycle that makes that possible. But for a lot of organisms instead, they're on what's known as the estral cycle where they can only reproduce for a small window throughout the year. For example, these two adorable skunks here, they could reproduce, but the Eastern spotted skunk on the left only reproduces in the late winter. And then the Western one over here only reproduces in the late summer. Since they reproduce at completely different times, that's the barrier that prevents them from reproducing. So we say that is temporal isolation. Behavioral isolation is the type of isolation that humans experience. This is when unique courtship rituals or behavioral patterns are what determine if organisms reproduce or not. For example, these blue-footed boobies here. These birds are found in the Galapagos. They have a dance where they move their feet like this. If another bird finds it, finds it attractive, they'll mate. 
if they're not into the dance, they won't mate. And there are so many different examples of this. To give you an idea of how propagated these examples are in evolution, I want you to look at some birds known as the birds of paradise. The character of the forest changes as you descend, becoming ever darker and damper, favoring different kinds of animals and plants. Less than 2% of the sunlight reaches the floor, but even here, there is extraordinary variety. In the great island of New Guinea, there are 42 different species of birds of paradise, each more bizarre than the last. so rich that nourishing food can be gathered very quickly. That leaves the male six-plumed bird of paradise with time to concentrate on other matters, like tidying up his display area. Everything must be spick and span. The paradise calls to attract a female. And he has more luck. But what does he have to do to really impress her? It's hard not to feel deflated when even your best isn't good enough. And these are just a few examples of the many, many different types of behavioral isolation. Next up is mechanical isolation. Sometimes two organisms can reproduce, but because of the morphology or shape of their genitalia, they can't. This happens a lot with plants, and especially with pollinators. If a bird is going to eat nectar out of a flower and pick up pollen as a result, if it can't fit its beak into the flower, it's not going to drink the nectar, it doesn't pick up the pollen, and there is no mating. This happens a lot with insects, too. For example, damselflies have a huge diversity and variety of penis sizes. Not all of them can fit into a corresponding vagina. That prevents mating from occurring. It's the shape or mechanics of it that prevents it. And then there's gametic isolation. Sometimes gametes meet, sperm does meet egg, but the sperm can't penetrate the egg. This happens a lot with creatures who are sedentary, who don't move, like sea urchins in the ocean. All of them are stuck in the one spot they're born in, so they will just shoot sperm and egg in every direction and different species will intermingle frequently. If the gametes can't combine, they're isolated, no baby, no species. And yes, that's what you're swimming in when you're in the ocean. Now let's look at post-zygotic barriers. These are instances when sperm does combine with egg, but the species isn't able to continue on. 
This is how we get hybrids, like the tiger, the zorse, a zebra and a horse, and a wolfin, a whale and a dolphin. First one is something called reduced hybrid viability. This is where sperm meets egg, and you do produce offspring, but the offspring are so unviable, they're so weak, that they don't survive to reproductive age. So the species never continues. This happens a lot with salamanders, even here in California. Salamanders will lay their eggs and sperm in fresh water, water that's constantly moving. So frequently, sperm and egg of one species will combine with the sperm and egg of another species. will combine, but the offspring's too frail to survive. So that's reduced hybrid viability. Next up is reduced hybrid fertility. This is when there is an offspring and it can live a long, happy life, but it's unable to make offspring of its own. It's infertile. Classic example is when you take a horse and a donkey and you get a mule. Mules can live long, happy, healthy lives. The problem is the horse has 64 chromosomes, the donkey has 62. That gives an odd number to the mule. With an odd number of chromosomes, meiosis is no longer possible. You can't make sperm or egg in a viable way because of that extra chromosome. You end up with sperm and or eggs that have one too many or one too few. And this is true for the zors, the tigon, the liger. It's why you don't see many of them. And the last one we need to worry about is something called hybrid breakdown. This is when the parent has kids and the kids are fertile and they have kids, but the ability of fertility breaks down and the grandchildren are now infertile. This is something you typically only see in plants when we're trying to make hybrids that have bigger yields of crops. Just a vocab point, the pre and post zygotic barriers that I just taught you also fall within a category of speciation or the formation of a new species that can be called allopatric or sympatric. Allopatric happens when two species are physically separated, so geographic isolation. Sympatric is when development of a new species happens and they live in the same area, there's no barrier between them. The speed at which species evolve is an ongoing debate. There's currently two models. When presented with an either or option, my philosophy is both are probably right or both are probably wrong. It's usually not one or the other. I just want you to be aware of these two. Oftentimes the development of a new species is gradual and happens slowly over time. We call this model gradualism. For example, with these butterflies, you can see these slowly become a little more orange and these slowly become a little more white. Another model is known as punctuated equilibrium. This is when speciation is not constantly happening. There isn't constant change, but instead there's some kind of dramatic event or change that forces a species to adapt. This could be like a bottleneck event. It could be some catastrophe that forces no changes and then punctuated by a sudden change into new organisms. Another twist on evolution is you can have something called convergent or divergent evolution. Convergent evolution happens when we have organisms of completely different type that evolve similar structures. For example, down here I have a shark, which is a fish, eh, fish -y. I have a reptile, and I have a dolphin. Completely different, mammal, reptile, fish but they all have a very similar body type. They have fins in the same location. This is convergent evolution. They've all converged on a similar body plan, but they don't share common ancestry. Hopefully you remember from earlier, this is what causes analogous structures. It's convergent evolution. There's a reason why the fins are only located in the ways they are. That is the most aerodynamic way to go through water. There's also divergent evolution. Divergent evolution occurs when two closely related species gradually become different. This is the evolution you're used to. And these are homologous structures. Organisms that used to be related, they have a common ancestor, but divulge.